here we are in terms of how software is delivered today. We have a really small forum, so um, anyone that wants to ask any questions, please just speak up uh, and we'll have a conversation. Um, so that there's tons of time today to talk about this. I've been squeezing this talk into about 45 minutes. Uh, so there's tons and tons of time. Um, so Rich gave me a little bit of an introduction. Uh, I'm a lifelong nerd. I've been using Linux since the 90s. Um, I you know, was teaching myself C++ when I was nine. Um, I'm, a, I'm a weird, weird person. <laughs> I did uh, cybersecurity for the DOD starting in 2016. I was an incident responder and threat hunter. Um, so I was doing defensive cyber operations, not like compliance checks. I was doing like active intrusion detection uh, and defense. Um, I worked in, he called it the nerd lab. That's the networking engineering research and development office uh, in the cyber protection brigade. And that is a backronym for sure. We were trying to name ourselves the nerd and we can't come up with some good words to do it. Um, I'm not, you know, if you can tell from my little short bio, I'm not a, a history buff. Um, I, I, you know, like books. I like computers more. I'm a math and science kind of guy most of the time. Um, but I am good at Googling interesting things. And I know a whole lot about navigating the Wayback Machine. And as this DevOps and DevSecOps uh, topic has gotten uh, to be so powerful and so commonly talked about, I wanted to understand sort of where it came from and, and hear the messages um, that we were getting. And I wanted to understand them. Because, you know, DevSecOps is not just about delivering software. It's a way of accomplishing things. Uh, the whole idea is collection of ideas behind DevSecOps is that the software itself is a means that is not the end. Um, and software isn't written in a vacuum, right? So I wanted to understand if this was a good way to accomplish things, if this was a better than the way that they kept talking about was bad. And I wanted to understand, you know, why everyone started talking about this at all. Um, and then, you know, uh, especially for my audiences, I wanted to understand what it would take for them to be able to really embrace these concepts and, and see this kind of value. So that's where my uh, research came from. And that's what led me to this talk. There's a whole lot of slides in this talk. Um, and normally they go really fast. Uh, a lot of them are just build up diagrams. Um, and if I skip over anything too fast for you, you can, you know, speak up and say you want to talk about something a little bit more. Uh, also, there's a link to these specific set of slides uh, at the end of the presentation. So if you want to grab that link, you can. First off, everyone talks about DevSecOps in terms of what it's not. Uh, everyone wants to say that DevOps and DevSecOps and, you know, digital transformation and all these things, they're not waterfall. They're better than waterfall. That's what everyone wants to say. Um, so this diagram is is kind of what waterfall is described as. It's a linear phased approach um, that starts off from requirements generation, moves through, you know, design, architecture, documentation, building, testing, you know, delivery, uh, and then maintenance and operations. Usually this kind of model is a, uh, accredited to Dr. Winston Royce. Um, he wrote a paper in 1970 on managing large software engineering projects. And that's where I pulled this diagram from. Uh, and everyone pins this model and this way of doing things on, on him. The problem is <laughs> that uh, Dr. Royce's own words on this model were that it was bad. He said it's, it's risky, it invites failure. The testing phase at the end is the first time where there can be any kind of feedback cycle. Um, and he says if, if any of this fails, then you're going to have to redo all of it. So why, why would you do it this way? So I don't understand how... Winston Royce ended up credited with designing this model. Um, he observed these phases and he criticized the model and he didn't call it waterfall. Um, and he was he was just really kind of upset. This is the way he had seen things happening. He presented this paper at IEEE Westcon um, and there was a large paper uh, that he, he brought along with it that discussed a lot of those concepts. So if Winston Royce, who is often credited with you know designing waterfall, didn't, didn't design waterfall, who was it? I was MIT in the Navy. So MIT Lincoln Labs in uh, 1956 were building, you know, custom software for custom computers that were using bespoke uh, machine learn machine languages. And these linear design that they developed focused on requirements, definitions, planning, implementation, and testing. They were really sort of emphasizing uh, heavily in their own paper 
um, the need to test while coding and that tests need to be written against requirements. So it really sounded a lot to me like test-driven development, um, but there was a very, very rigid requirements and design to code and test barrier. They really wanted to know what they were building before they started building it. And I, I think that makes a lot of sense to me because you know they had these custom machines and they were doing all of this uh, you know bespoke one-off stuff and they didn't really know um, a better way at the time. They were still figuring these kind of things out and working within the constraints. Um, I can understand that rigid barrier and that linear design. So what did Winston Royce really think? Um, the first off he thought for sure that designing and defining the, he called it the data processing modes um, needed to be done early, even at the risk of being wrong. So he really wanted, you know, if we think about like object oriented design, he wanted your classes well planned and all of your interfaces well planned before you began doing anything, even if your design was going to turn out to be bad. He thought that uh, everything needed to be documented. He has a lot of quotes on this that I, I really, really like. Uh, and I think that they really state how strong his position was. He said, an acceptable written description forces the designer to take an unequivocal position to, and provide tangible evidence of completion. So if you didn't document what you were headed towards, then you could never arrive there. Um, he thought, if documentation does not yet exist, there is as yet no design only people thinking and talking about the design, which is of some value, but not much. I think that's <laughs> a strong point from Dr. Royce saying that documenting the design, uh, you know, functionally was the only way to actually have one. He also said the real monetary value of good documentation begins downstream in the development process during the testing phase and continues through operations and redesign. Now there's an interesting word choice at the end there through redesign. Because Dr. Royce believed that everything that you did while developing software, you should do two times. Um, his exact quote on the subject is, if, a, if the computer program in question is being developed for the first time, arrange matters so that the version finally delivered to the customer for operational deployment is actually the second version, insofar as critical design and operations areas are concerned. So he wanted you to go through this process of figuring out how you were going to write this program documenting everything about how you were going to write this program, write the program, implement all the tests, do everything, and then use that as a prototype that never gets released and use all of the lessons learned from solving all of those problems to go influence a new design and to go influence the writing of new documentation and to re recode the whole thing from scratch a second time. You know, there's a, a common quote, uh, it says no plan of operations extends with any certainty beyond the first contact with the main hostile force. I was in the army a year ago and we have a, you know, a cruder way of saying the same thing. Uh, but the, the whole point here is that the main hostile force is your end users and your tests. So if your plan isn't going to survive, you need to do some, you know, some dry runs. You need to do some sand tables. <laughs> so he also thought that uh, without question, the biggest user of project resources would be the test phase. Um, the test engineers who were rigging up all of this software on these computers and going through the process of ensuring that everything was working correctly, you know, were not the guys that wrote it and they weren't the guys that were going to use it. And so here is why he thought his documentation was so important, because these test engineers in this construct had never seen this program before and didn't even know how to use it because they didn't know what it was going to do. They weren't really the end users. They had the list of requirements and they had the program. And so anything else beyond that, the documentation was the only thing that they had to know how to, to make it do what it was supposed to do and run it through its bases. So he believed that um, this extremely lengthy period of time was sort of the, res the reason that so much other time was spent documenting and designing everything well. But then he also thought that uh, he, his quote was, to give the contractor free reign between requirements, definition, and operation is inviting trouble. Uh, he didn't believe that there would be really any way for uh, you to write software without having the customer involved repeatedly throughout the process. Tons of feedback loops. He wanted them to review the preliminary design. He wanted them to review uh, the initial, re you know, the first design attempt before you went and redid everything. He wanted them to review the design considerations as the, the final version of the program was being written. And he wanted them involved in all of the testing very heavily. 
So you'll sometimes hear this referred to as Royce's final design. Um, and he presented this in the exact same paper that he presents the linear phased approach. This is just, you know, he starts with the bad and he works his way up to, this is what I think the software design process should look like. The classical approach that was later referred to as waterfall, he believed was deeply flawed. And it wasn't even until 1976 that Bell and Thayer in another IEEE paper um, called it waterfall. In 1970, he was emphasizing documentation, a blend of automated and manual testing, heavy customer design process and iterative development with experimentation as well as you could within time constraints. It's not, you know, DevOps, but this doesn't look like a linear phased approach to me. So I find it interesting that he always ends up vilified uh, for, for creating this, this model. So all of that wisdom and knowledge and experience between Bell and Thayer in 76 and Dr. Royce in 1970 saying that it can't be a linear design and that there must be feedback loops and automated testing is incredibly important, uh, all of these things. The DOD, uh, for its part, um, put out uh, DOD standard 2167A in 1985 that uh, just mandated the requirements for all software design for the DOD both contractors and internal and any other software design projects for the DOD. And they said, uh, it could be anything you want as long as it's waterfall. So this is where we, <laughs> this is where the, the uh, defense industrial complex, if you will, uh, ended up with this cycle because it was mandated despite people knowing that it wasn't, wasn't the right way. Uh, and I gave this talk uh, at a, a conference that was for CPE credits. So we had uh, little checking questions embedded because those are required during your CPE credits. Um, and I think that these are good points to review and sort of understand things. Of course, now my picture is in the way of the thing. So we'll pull that off. So, you know, Winston Royce's waterfall development method, um, I didn't think it was a linear phased approach. Uh, it doesn't look like one to me. It looks there's a lot of arrows, there's cycles, there's feedback. Um, there's iteration. I, I still don't think that it's a, a scalable framework. There's a lot of constraints in, in this model. Um, but this model was also designed for a world where people were writing software and then releasing it and delivering it to customers. And then it was off running in production from someone else. And, you know, the people who wrote it weren't, weren't there anymore. Um, maybe there was a maintenance tail contract where they were expected to deliver, you know, releases, but it wasn't something that was really designed in the way that modern software development frameworks are designed. So, and then the last bit is that, uh, <laughs> I don't think that, uh, Winston Royce really appreciated the way that management was trying to force him to do things. And I think that his paper was a, a complaint against that linear phased approach. So I don't think that, uh, his own model was something that was being forced on people against their will. I think this was him identifying problems in other people's, uh, ideas about how to do this. So the DOD originally described that linear phase approach in 1956. Um, they mandated them in 1985. And then other people knew that that wasn't a great idea. Uh, but that's kind of how things were happening uh, throughout that period. The next person that I thought had a really interesting take on how to develop software was Grady Booch. And anyone that has um, any kind of CS background is probably very familiar with Grady Booch. So uh, Grady Booch wrote the book on how to do object oriented program design. Um, his two cycle process described how to do object oriented design as a method. Mostly Grady Booch is known for um, his diagramming syntax. So Grady Booch invented the, the precursor to what today is known as UML. So UML are how people design and document object oriented classes and, and Grady Booch invented it. Um, but he had an entire chapter devoted to process and uh, it was sort of a rebuttal to the waterfall des design that had been forced on him by his management as well. This is a foreword from this chapter. Um, I'm just gonna let you guys read it because it's kind of long and it's really uh, nuanced, so. I really love his last sentence here. Um, 
the professional acknowledges the importance of creating certain documents, but never does so at the expense of making sensible architectural innovations. Grady Booch believed that a programmer's main job was to solve hard problems elegantly. And you weren't going to be able to do that if you were busy writing, you know, elaborate and redundant documentation. He believed documentation was important. He, he didn't believe that it was the most important thing a programmer could do and that they should prioritize appropriately. Now, from chapter six, um, he talked about those diagrams a lot. They eventually formed UML. Uh, this combined with two other efforts, um, but mostly it's there. If you look at Grady Booch's diagrams and you look at UML, it's the same. <laughs> he devoted this whole chapter uh, to process this, the way that he wanted to do that was to split the actual software development process into two separate loops. And he intended for them to be loops. One of those loops was the macro process, which was sort of aligned to the, the waterfall style that management had sort of come to expect, but it was designed to be cyclical still. And the micro process was this tight loop of what a software developer should actually be doing that is completely unrelated to that macro process that may not involve the developer at all those phases. He considered that macro process loop as a, a way for PMs to sort of shield productive developers um, from expectations and enabled them to focus on, um, you know, those innovations that were important for them solving those problems elegantly. He covers everything really well in his book uh, and, you know, Grady Booch is a lot smarter than I am. So I'm going to once again quote him a few times. <laughs> he said, uh, the, the macro process is the controlling framework for the micro process. Many elements are simply sound software management practice. And so apply equally to object oriented as well as non object oriented systems. Um, the macro process focuses upon risk and architectural vision, the two manageable elements that have the greatest impact upon schedules, quality and completeness. So those are his key objectives uh, for a software development project. He wanted the project delivered on time. He wanted the project to do what it was supposed to do and to do it well. And he wanted um, all of the requirements to be met. He didn't want to have, you know, part of a customer's need met through a software design process. That was really what he thought developing software was for. Um, and he embedded the, the things that were the most important to achieving those goals into his macro process. He also said for all interesting software, the macro process repeats itself after major product releases. I really like the way he worded that there um, for all interesting software. So if you wrote software and it went off into delivery and did what it was supposed to do until you know the system was decommissioned, then he thought it was boring. It does a job, it does it, you know, it does it well, and that's easy. But for things where I might be releasing different, you know, new versions and new features and things like that. It's more interesting to completely restart this process over for every one of those major releases and really think through cool new ways to architect the software to achieve these different kinds of goals. Um, and then he also said that the basic philosophy of the macro process is that of incremental development. So I really like this uh, model. He's taken the things that are about vision. He's taken the things that are about expectations. He's taken the things that are about, um, you know, sort of the boring parts and embedded them into just phases that loop around over and over again. Eventually he calls a release done and says, we're gonna start over and reimagine a new design for the next version. His micro process uh, is is very straightforward and it's very object oriented focused. So it's not generalized, but um, it's about implementing classes. So uh, to a large extent, the microprocess represents the daily activities of the individual developer or a small team of developers. So he thought that like a, a small group of people would be doing all of these things together by community rather than one person just doing this and they just look at their chart and figure out what their next thing to do is. This is sort of how teams organize their activities, he thought. He also said uh, that, where, where is it? The, um, the specific where it says identify class and object semantics. He discussed this with the phrase, you were supposed to discover those abstractions that form the vocabulary of the problem domain. I think this is really interesting because it's sort of, um, you know, implies Grady's own personal belief that software should be written uh, to model the world 
and it should not be written to solve a problem or it, it, you know it, it's modeling the world in order to predict a thing it's not doing a thing for the sake of doing it uh, he says you're discovering the abstraction the abstraction is already there in grady's view he believes that software good software design should be self-evident when you look at software that solves a problem it clearly describes the problem you're trying to solve and models that in a way that is useful and valuable to the programmer. It's a, a heavy domain driven design belief. And uh, it's really elegantly stated here when he, when he talks about discovering programming abstractions rather than inventing them. You know, it focuses first on these behavior and defers the decisions about representation until as late as possible. So he, again, based on his modeling syntax, believed that you should discuss, you know, focus on how to structure your program and what you want it to do before you worry about how to make it do it. Um, because he believed that the interactions between components were more important than the way you implemented the actions themselves. Um, and he also described early versions of this in 1982 in the first edition of uh, this book but he really refined them pretty significantly in the, uh, the second iteration. So then this is crazy. <laughs> this is where things get really weird. Um, large groups of developers were sick of micromanagement. Um, Grady had been trying to, you know, invent a way to shield developers from the management expectations and the, the product release cycle. Um, Dr. Royce was upset about uh, expectations for linear approaches that didn't allow iteration or understanding, and, and no one had really gotten that picture. Um, there was this organizational body, you know, so ISO, IEC, and IEEE put out this paper called uh, 12207. It was a standard uh, from all three organizations that describes how like software development and delivery should happen. And it's like 140 pages of describing in detail the interactions between groups in a software delivery model. Um, and there's like a page and a half on how the developers should actually fit into solving that problem. They're the guys that are solving the problem and they're, they're just a part of this massive machine. And, so these 17 guys, some of them were kind of big names at the time, and some of them, you know, weren't. Um, they're called the Snowbird 17, uh, got together and went on a little trip, locked themselves in a cabin and discussed what they thought was necessary to deliver software. Um, the essence was everyone's doing this wrong, and this is the only stuff that matters. So this is a direct copy of the Agile Manifesto itself. Um, they said that prescribed processes and provided tools don't matter. And if you have people working together, they can accomplish anything. They said that comprehensive documentation didn't matter. The effort should be focused on making it work, not making it clear how it works on paper. They said that contract negotiation and requirements definition don't matter. You should work with the customer and make them happy. The terms are unimportant. If the developers are doing what the customer wants, then the customer will continue to pay the developers what they need. And they said that detailed plans that explain how a thing should be done are a waste of time because change is going to happen and you need to be ready for that change. And plans are the antithesis to agility. They thought if you plan everything meticulously, you'll never be able to react because your plans will become outdated before they're done. These were crazy concepts. Yeah, I see. So, <laughs> it's it's a it's a contentious point that they make, um, and it, they also um, were only thinking about development. They weren't thinking about anything outside of development. From a developer's perspective, this is what matters: writing the best software that you can to solve those needs. Their twelve principles um, laid out how they believe this should be done now. Keep in mind that the Snowbird 17 wrote these documents in 2001. So most people were still making software to sell uh, and other people were buying software to use. SaaS wasn't really a thing. Um, and, and modern models of software delivery weren't prevalent or common. You know, Google was around, but YouTube wasn't in 2001. So that's where we are in internet history. But they were already emphasizing continuous delivery um, they were already emphasizing, uh, 
the, the maximizing the amount of work not done is a great principle that I always like to, to go back to. They want things to be as automated as possible and as minimalistic as possible to achieve the objective with as little amount of effort and code as possible. Um, the problem with agile, of course, is that uh, marketing hype took over and companies stepped in. Now, these were like 17 anarchists railing against the software industry and the way that things were done. And these days, um, people will sell you courses and they'll tell you the way that you actually achieve this process. And they'll tell you that it requires this ritual and that sort of timing and things like that. So there's this principle called like dark agile or faux agile. Uh, and I really like this slide. I did censor the title, but otherwise it's an exact copy. Uh, the, the point is that corporations really co-opted the agile document. Um, managers misunderstood it. So now we have scrum masters and strict processes and exhaustive planning, planning to plan the plans. And we still call it agile. Um, agile itself started to take off, but didn't really get as far as I think it could have, uh, in the software world, because it really wasn't the whole picture. You know, these guys were focused on development. Um, and they solved developers' problems uh, in delivering software. So uh, what was left was people wrapping it up in other things with their own ideas about how to fill these, these gaps beyond development. You know, working software over comprehensive documentation, as long as that software is comprehensively documented. <laughs> individuals and interactions over processes and tools. And there are mandatory processes and tools to control how those inner individuals interact. Like this is what agile means today to most people. And it's really unfortunate because it's exactly the intent of the original authors. Once again, one of our, uh, this was a presentation and CPE credit checking questions was, you know, what was going on. So a is really, um, <laughs> what happens today. <laughs> We're going to use Agile, so we must buy Jira. Uh, B is, you know, scheduled meetings with ritualistic elements where someone has like a microphone that they're passing around and they have to hold the microphone to talk. The Agile, you know, the Snowbird 17 in their manifesto said people need to work using whatever methods they can. And the, the ways to work together will become evident for every individual team. So shoehorning a methodology into a, a development group isn't what they envisioned at all. You can read some of their blogs where they rant about this, by the way, because they're all pretty upset about what it's become. Um, carefully articulated requirements before any work starts. They're like, no, we'll get to it. We're going to get, you know, we need MVP first. <laughs> and then a heavy emphasis on continuous communication as a means to improve understanding amongst development teams, managers, and customers is definitely what they meant. Talking was important. Communication was key. It was everything. To the to the snowbird 17. so developers had revolted against those machinations that made them unproductive they started that agile movement and infrastructure engineers um, began to get curious about the agile world um, by this time 2008 we were really living in the internet driven age so youtube had been around for a whole year at this point you know the internet the modern internet existed <laughs> functionally by now um, so they considered, you know, sort of changing things up on their own. Uh, there were two guys who uh, started really advocating this much earlier than anyone else. One of them was Andrew Clay Schaefer, and another one was Patrick Dubois. Um, they wanted to build a model where infrastructure engineers were operations guys, Linux guys, right, could uh, use the agile framework in ways that made them productive. Um, and they called it just agile infrastructure. They wanted to use some of the same technologies, thought models, and principles that agile developers had been embracing. Um, the key like idea that they had about why this was important was that developers and operations had become very adversarial in this, you know, SaaS world. Um, developers delivering straight into production uh, and production requiring uptime and performance and stability. They started having these competing sort of concerns. And Patrick Dubois and Andrew Clay Schaefer said, you know, they've got to work better together because really they're both trying to make their businesses successful. Um, and even though their goals seem opposed, it's really important that there's a good balance. 
So if we get them using similar methodologies with different responsibilities, but maximize that communication between those groups, um, we're going to have a better outcome. Uh, agile developers didn't really like this. Uh, those who had really embraced agile, the sort of like anarchist crew, um, really liked keeping agile theirs. And so as these guys tried to get involved in some of like the DevOps days conferences or in, before the Dev, in the agile conferences, um, they were getting sort of shunned. But I think really the moment that this changed and that there was a, a short flash to bang was um, when Flickr talked about what they had been doing. Um, so Patrick Dubois was a consultant. He was a Belgian consultant, and he noticed all this animosity between developers and operations uh, when he was on site trying to help people work better together. Um, he decided that really not only did the agile model have something to teach the operations crews, but he believed that the developers had to care about operations concerns because they didn't really. Agile had isolated them from operations concerns and that communication between the two would help build some empathy. Um, when new things broke production and ops denied change requests to keep things stable, the business wasn't successful. You know, they weren't doing the things that they needed to do. So neither of them were achieving their actual goal. Andrew Clay Schaefer at the time, he was working at Reductive Labs uh, on Puppet before it was released. So Puppet, very popular today, very well known in general. He met with uh, Patrick at AgileCon 2008, um, and they had a conversation after Patrick's presentation where he proposed this idea. Um, there was a meeting. It was supposed to be a meet and greet in one of the conference rooms, and it was an open invitation to everyone. Those are the only two guys that showed up. <laughs> so they sat in a room, the two of them, and, and sat and talked for a while and sort of ironed out how the thought model would work and how um, this could actually, you know, potentially result in better outcomes. They started talking about it. Um, and as they started talking about it publicly and blogging about it and tweeting about it, uh, people came out of the woodwork to talk about their experiences because some people had already been exploring these concepts. And so this really changed everything. Um, Flickr had already been doing this. They had six primary tools and they don't mean um, individual like name brand tools, six like tools in the toolbox uh, and four important cultural changes that they identified that helped them uh, break the cycle. They wanted to learn how developers and operations could work together better and more frequently. Um, and so John Allspa and Paul Hammond, the, the vice president of technical operations and the director of engineering gave this conference um, talk called 10 deploys per day. And the essence is that um, manual processes were slow and error prone and big changes were hard to troubleshoot. So they decided that they needed to make smaller changes more frequently using automation in a way that enabled the two teams to understand each other's work better and to com communicate their needs better. They solved the problems by implementing new kinds of tools, embracing CICD uh, and changing their culture to match and encourage that collaboration. And wonderful things started happening. You know, their website just kept getting better. It was going down <clears throat> less and less frequently. Their uptime was up. They understood more about their uptime. The operations crews understood more about how to manipulate the application. The developer crew understood how to give operations crews the control they needed over the application. And, and they just started, you know, making magic happen. If you want to know what I think, like the essence of DevOps is, what these guys did is it. Um, and if you have not watched this video, I beg you to watch this video. I, it's so much better than my talk. <laughs> if you go to red.ht slash 10 dash deploys, it'll link you straight to YouTube. It's 46 minutes and 21 seconds. And it's about these two guys talking about how they were doing DevOps before it had a name, before it was cool, telling you everything they did wrong and all the lessons they learned along the way. And they really lay out all of the concepts for the foundation of what we know as DevOps today. And it was all because Flickr was willing to talk about this weird new thing they'd been doing. So Patrick Dubois got to organizing and started a new conference because Agile Con didn't like them so much. You have a question? Okay. So he uh, invited his old friend, 
from sitting in that single conference room together, uh, Andrew Clay Schaefer to help moderate the first DevOps Days conference. Um, they finally settled on this name as opposed to Agile Infrastructure because um, it was shorter and more memorable. Um, and the essence was, you know, these ideas when executed well made things better. And so they started asking people to come and talk about it. Um, and the point is that they were trying to make is that it wasn't about making developers into operations guys, and it wasn't about making infrastructure engineers into developers. It was about having a common framework in which to communicate like agile, but across teams. Uh, will the deck be shared afterwards? Yes. Yeah, there's a link uh, at the end of the, the deck that lets you download the PDF. <clears throat> So the essence of, of DevOps, uh, according to Patrick Dubois, was empathy. Um, the most important part was understanding each other and understanding each other's concerns. Sometimes you'll hear an acronym CAMS, culture, automation, measurement, and sharing. So the culture is, uh, of course, really important. The automation is the only way you're ever going to achieve it. Measurement is because you're, you can't get better if you don't know what better is or how you're doing. Uh, and sharing, I think, is is really um, best exemplified by again the Flickr talk, where you know when they messed up, they talked about it. Um, when you see things like postmortems uh, hosted publicly, that's you know what it takes to get better. So, 2012 for the advent of DevSecOps as a concept is kind of a guess. It's the earliest I can find some references to the word. It wasn't really embraced super early. Um, the, the 2012 references from a guy named Chris Boitart, I think I can't pronounce that name very well because he is also Belgian and don't mess with Belgians. They're going to automate circles around you. That's what I learned while researching this. Um, and Chris's, you know, basic argument was it just makes sense. You know, I don't know why we didn't do this in the first place was his, his basic guy. In his presentation, he's got this quote from Tim Bray. Um, where Tim Bray in 2010 identified that DevOps was already providing better security than anyone uh, else was. Tim Bray said that, you know, they don't know how to do legacy enterprise software development. They don't know how to do UML, which at this time, you know, it's fun that we go through this history and now UML is old. Uh, you know, they don't know how to do any of these things, but they're producing better software in less time with lower risk than we ever were before. Um, Tim Bray's kind of a big deal. Uh, he invented XML, um, for example. So he's he's a big deal. Uh, he was on the, the governing body that invented JSON. So if you hate XML and you like JSON, he had that idea too. Um, he's, a, he's a big deal in the software engineering world. So here's uh, a, the slide where Chris really makes clear uh, in that uh, conference. He, he gave that talk at an OWASP conference in Belgium, by the way. It's a security symposium. So uh, he said that, that sysadmins caused all of these problems uh, for developers, and that's why DevOps came to be. It was to resolve these conflicts. But even with DevOps, uh, security officers are causing the exact same problems. Now, there's one note. He does say that security officers have this extra problem. He says security officers have an expiry date. And I'm pretty sure what he means there is that uh, when you get hacked, they get fired. Because uh, if your site goes down, the operations guy can bring it back up. But if your entire user database gets leaked, you can't get unhacked, right? So the security guy is going to get fired. So now you're going to have a new security guy and a totally different person to work with. And that just adds more problems because they're also going to say no. And now they're going to say no harder because you just got hacked. So the point was that you know now DevOps and security are fighting, and security is vitally important, um, especially for my customer base, being the public sector. Security is really important, um, so it's they can't afford <laughs> to not consider it in this way. And so the lessons that we learned from Agile and the lessons that we learned from DevOps were that communicating was one of the most important things. Um, respect of the expertise of people with different areas of uh, concern than you was what was really important to DevOps. Mutual trust across teams um, is what enabled people to work in that way. And so Chris said, why aren't we doing this with our security teams? Why are our auditors coming in after the fact? You know, we've got to ingrain them in this process. You know, the, the idea is continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous compliance all in one 
one process that is cyclical and iterative will lead to continuous improvement. So <clears throat> I think that what is really most important here is that we can't define DevSecOps or DevOps in terms of what it's not, like so many people want to do. We can't say it's better than Waterfall because most people don't even know what Waterfall means or where it came from. And everyone's ideas of where Waterfall came from may not even be right. You know, Waterfall was outdated in 1970. So why are we talking about DevSecOps being better than the, the methodology presented in 1970? Uh, documentation had been de-emphasized by Agile, but uh, it's critically important for DevOps and DevSecOps. Uh, continuous delivery with integrated teams that have to understand each other's work. It's a form of asynchronous communication. Um, and communication being so important um, across these teams, not just within them really sort of makes documentation matter a lot again. So Dr. Royce and Grady Booch were right. You know, the documentation does matter. You know, maybe uh, Agile is the right way to go for a certain organization because they're primarily a development organization. They're focused on meeting the needs of some customer who's consuming their software. Maybe DevOps or DevSecOps is the right way to go so that people can focus on delivering quality products and improving things all of the time. And if you can define everything as code and always work on the code, always define new goals and work to achieve them, and then you can always get better. And always getting better on an infinite time scale achieves perfection. Time isn't infinite, but you can't afford to stagnate. And I think you really have to you know, learn from your mistakes and work as a team to solve these kind of problems. Once again, one of our uh, CPE questions. Um, yeah, so people want to say that uh, DevSecOps solves all of your problems and your code's going to be great because you're considering security early and they're wrong. Your code's going to have problems. <laughs> you're going to, all code has problems. Code is written by humans. We're imperfect. Um, teams are, are going to trust each other more and your software will continue to get better. So that was the right answer there, B. Your teams will get angrier with each other because they have to deal with each other face to face more, making for longer release cycles. And that is probably true at the beginning. If you're moving from an old water, an old model to this, there it's going to be rough. Uh, and especially if people are expected to like pass a microphone around to wait their turn to talk, someone's going to yell over someone. It'll happen. Um, and then the last bit is that culture processes and expectations don't need to change. You can just implement a few more meetings and everything will work out. And that's you know what happened to Agile, so don't do it to DevOps, please. Uh, I love this quote, and, and Rich, I know, I think loves this quote, because all of us in Red Hat's North American public sector love this quote. All of us is smarter than any of us. So this is the essence of open source. Um, you know, it doesn't matter how smart any one person is, a community, a team will always have a better answer than any one person. Um, and using this concept and applying it beyond open source software development and talking about, you know, team organization and saying all of us need to share ideas better is really kind of the essence. Uh, and because this talk is for the public sector, I always bring up that the bad news is that this quote is from a book from 1992, where we talk about how public sector methodology is going to fix the government. <laughs> and it's from 1992, and we're still talking about it today. They haven't really given it a, a good go yet. Um, my message is to the government in these cases is always that uh, it's a it's a, like a tall mountain, like there's a lot to do, and you know we shouldn't despair and go. I guess we'll never change. Um, we should recognize that we've not been changing the way that we need to, and we need to focus on getting to work and you know growing productivity within our spheres of influence. Um, because you, you can't afford to not do this well. And that's uh, that's my talk on the history of DevSecOps. There is a download link there for this exact slide deck, which it was for a GovLoop conference. So that's that's what's in the link. That's all of that. So. James, I really appreciate you doing this. I love how it sets the context for where all this came from and how this evolved over time to address problems. You know, this wasn't just something that was created in a lab. It was based on practical and real world experience that drove us to this. Well, one question I have, and you know, the challenge I see in the public sector is that the contract, the, the, the contract models and how they do acquisitions really fight against this. Like this is not the way that, that, that 
things can be done easily in the current model of acquisition. So as an example, in my experience in the system integrators and Pete's got more recent experience is the earn value management model where you define in your schedule specific artifacts you're going to produce. And then as you produce those artifacts, you retire the value of the contract. So you say, I was going to write 15 user stories. When I write 15 user stories, I've now gotten earned 10% of my total value of this contract, which goes against this idea that the only thing of value is working software. Everything else is just kind of shelfware and BS. So you get this false sense that you're making all this progress when the reality is that if the system doesn't work at the end or doesn't produce what the customer wants, you've really made no progress at all. So, right. so it's, but this, this is, is how we ended up with Mill Connect. But, but there are extensive organizations and, and Pete, I don't want to speak for you because, you know, you came from the same background I did, but, you know, you've worked for other companies too, but there's extensive organizations within companies that look at things like cost accounting and finance management and how much money they've made against the contract. And they have to answer questions from the defense control auditing and, you know, all these guys that or the defense contract auditing agency that, that check all these things to make sure that all the rules are being followed. So, so there's regulatory constraints that I think fight against this. There's just the entire acquisition model that fights against this. And I mean, what, what is your, you know, we come from the same kind of background. What's your, what's your take and, you know, how, how do you break through this kind of, I guess, inertia that exists against these sort of changes? Within the DOD, uh, specifically, it's being addressed some by changing some of the contracting models as they move to the OTAs um, for rapid acquisitions. Um, there's the IT box concept that has been uh, taking off in some of the organizations within you know, different product management um, in the DoD. They're, where they're saying like, you know, we need a thing that does this thing and we're gonna acquire that thing. And if later we need more of them, we don't need to acquire the same thing because we just need to acquire something that does a thing. Um, so those kind of concepts are working their way into the DOD and they're gaining popularity. Um, another thing that's really been vitally important is that um, I've been messaging this to the DOD uh, since I left <laughs> the DOD um, because I, I was there and I saw things going horribly, horribly wrong um, and there was nothing I could do about it from the position I was in then. So if I can, um, I think that really if we convince people that these ideas are sound, um, and that this is a better way of doing things, we can change the way they prioritize um, how they're doing those acquisitions. And it's really about the prioritization, right? Like like you said, the the idea of retiring <clears throat> some of the, the contract against, uh, <clears throat> gosh, something that's not as uh, important as like actual functional software that does what they needed it to do. Um, you know, getting them to understand uh, what, what's the, so we have a, a coworker uh, that always likes to say prod or it didn't happen. Um, you know, prod or it didn't happen. Make the thing work um, the way that we need it to work or else it may as well not have happened. If we can convince more of the DOD to structure that into their contracts and to exercise those OTAs as ways to get more rapid acquisitions and as ways to use the IT box concept to get more flexibility in their acquisitions, then it can encourage more, um, again, better products can come in for competition um, because the premise of this is that DevSecOps produces better software. It's not just that it's a cooler way of doing it, it's that it makes better software that better meets the needs of the end users. So if we encourage more of that competition, enable more of that flexibility and add some agility to that contracting process through rapid acquisitions um, and, and get the DOD convinced that these are the, the things that matter, you know, the ability to do things the the right way, the expedient way, and still the secure way. Um, we can move away from that model some. The catch is that it really, um, it isn't the way things have been done uh, for a long time. So there's PMs in, in all of these different offices that are all making different acquisition decisions. And they all need convinced because the system isn't going to uh, change itself. The people in the system need to change it. So again, uh, communication is key, right? Um, we have to talk to them and get them to understand, you know, what it means to produce correct software or how to be valuably productive. And I think it, it pushes toward like a diffusion or democratization of how code is produced, where today the sole source model seems to be more prevalent. So 
you know, as the customer, as the actual end user, whether it's the army or the air force or somebody else sets up a DevSecOps pipeline and invites people to contribute code to it, that then makes this sort of marketplace of ideas contributing to the final solution. But, but that's not how these things are structured. And company X wants to be the one that provides the solution, not, 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 not a group of individuals, you know, so yeah. in some ways this parallels the open source model as well, where anybody can join a project and contribute. And you don't necessarily need to be the world's best programmer to make a contribution. You can submit documentation changes. You can write up some tests. You can find bugs and, and report those bugs. Like, And all of those small contributions drive to something much greater than you on your own could ever create yourself. There's a great illustration. When I joined Red Hat, they would always have a executive come speak to us, you know, the new class of, of employees and sort of, you know, give them a little inspirational message. So I got to hear from Michael Tiemann, who was the original creator of the GNU compiler collection. So, you know, he was the founder of Cygnus Software in the 80s, who wanted to create an open source C, C++ compiler for x86. Um, and he taught, took his daughter to a museum. I think it was in San Francisco. I'm not 100% sure. But he described in this museum a large concrete column hanging from the ceiling. And, and I'm talking, this thing was tons. It was huge. And around the base was a band of iron. And then children had tiny little magnets attached to strings. And if you tossed the magnet at the piece of iron, it would stick. But the slightest tug would just pop it right off. So he said the trick to the thing was to barely pull your magnet off at just the right time to start this column moving. And if you did this repeatedly and timed it well, all of these tiny little interactions between these very weak magnets and this band of iron on this several ton column would get this thing swinging several feet in either direction. And he said for him, that was sort of a realization that this is the power of open source. This is why this model is so powerful in delivering capability and, and, and um, value to the, to the users that participate in it, that all of those tiny con contributions can have big effects. And, and it's not just one person trying to shove that column around. It's, it's these tiny little interactions that, that can make big things. So th this does very much. I think DevSecOps for a lot of our customers is really hard to deal with because it is a fundamental change to how they're used to doing things or how they've done things in the past. There's a lot of legacy, I think, contracts and programs and things that, you know, it's not going to change overnight. So my focus is always looking for those opportunities where you can start to begin that change, you know, and not try to boil the ocean. But I don't want to dominate the conversation. So if folks have something to contribute, please, please jump in. Hey, James. Um, I'm Mark Nichols. Um, a really excellent talk. I was I came in just a little bit late, but I feel like you've like been following me around at work for the last 10 years. It's just uh yeah, it's, I, I, I came out of the private sector for most of my career, and then the last 10 years, I moved over into government under DOD, uh, initially doing cybersecurity, um, and then and then have, have and then went through system engineering, infrastructure, and then I'm back in development now, which is where I kind of began. So I've had an interesting perspective on this whole thing, and and the uh, the program I work for, uh, we are doing quote unquote DevSecOps, but it's very much like you described. You know, we're agile, but it's really it's really a half hour agile. So it's, it's, um, it's but you know, one of the things I think, um, Rich mentioned that really chimed into, I mean, yeah, I think the, the contracting piece really messes with things, you know, like where we are, we have three different contracts doing, uh, development, uh, infrastructure and, and cyber, and, and cybersecurity. So they're all fighting each other all the time. So there's no trust, right? You talked about trust. Yeah. That's it just the, the contract, just the realities of contracting are fighting against that. And, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's uh, it's it's hard to, you know, I think people kind of know where they want to get, but you're just kind of swimming upstream. And then the other thing is with cybersecurity and DoD, particularly, as I'm sure you're aware, you know, the way at least at least the way it's been traditionally done, they're trying to move away from it a little bit now, but it's very very much not agile at all, right? These huge accreditation cycles that go for years. Hmm. Well, it's not. There's nothing nothing iterative about it. You know, they they have this whole concept of continuous. Um, 
um, monitoring right you know going on now but they're they're nowhere near there yet. You mean the so, rmf process i was helping them implement portions of that too but it you know right, <laughs> right. i mean it's, it's good in theory you know but it just it just takes a really long time so it's yeah so it's kind of this i think everything you described is the place we all kind of want to get to but just so many things in the way of, of getting there, at least in the dod world i've really wondered about like i said my, most of my career first on was in the private sector i've really wondered because i've been out kind of out of that world for a while is is it going better there you know, or not. I'm not really sure. I haven't heard, had an insight to that. Yes and no. <laughs> so my, um, again, I, I've been public sector now for uh, well, well over a decade as well. But I, at Red Hat, I get a lot of opportunity to peek into the private sector uh, as yeah. well. And I, I see, um, you know, the gamut. <laughs> I see organizations that are small and moving fast and doing things right. And then I see lots and lots of organizations that are very happy with the way that they've been doing things and they're going to get outpaced by um, someone that's, that's more willing to move quickly. So um, I think it comes down to kind of the age and size of the organization and the leadership, but you really do see kind of the gamut. Um, and without the, the massive controlling factor of like DOD contracting and congressional reporting and things like right. that, that we have in the public sector, um, you know, there is a, a lot of opportunity for more variance. Um, and so you see that, I think, a lot. Yeah. Can I make a comment? I really agree. Yeah. Um, so I guess the notion of various contracts being handled by a development group, um, an infrastructure group, and an ops group, um, and that they're fighting, they're always they're constantly arguing, they're pointing, pointing, pointing fingers at each other. I mean... That's a management issue. That that should be a customer management issue, basically saying, okay, you guys need to get on the same page. So it really depends a lot on, on the efficacy of that organization, um, which will, because that's where I work, that, that's the case all the time. There are different contracts, different pieces of the uh, data flow, if you will, that uh, have to be managed. And, you know, contractors are always like, trying to, well, I shouldn't say this, but, you, you know, you don't, it, it's hard to admit fault. Um, and um, the, the pointing is the one thing that Flickr said you cannot do. They said there, you can never blame anyone ever again. Stop it. <laughs> right. Well, you shouldn't because right. that's not productive. Um, I guess the other, the other point I want to make is as far as planning and, and, uh, you know, in the, um, in the military, they, there's, a, there's an old statement that says um, planning is vital, but plans are useless. So, you, 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 you know, from going from a Tuesday to a Thursday, you, you kind of have to know what you want to do. But once, once, once it's actually taken care of, then what you planned on Tuesday isn't really of, of, uh, uh, of any value. The other thing about, about documentation that I think I think documentation needs to evolve with the actual system because you don't want to get in situations where I've been many times in which I'm coming in and the system's already, you know, fielded and I'm there for sustainment. And I look back at the documentation. I'm like, I can't believe they didn't do this. I can't believe they didn't do that. I can't believe they didn't do this. And I'm kind of left holding the bag trying to figure out how things are supposed to work. Yeah. I 100% agree. And I think that that's one of those points when you have a separate sustainment organization or a separate right. operating organization that makes it really tough too. Right. I mean, I, you know, that, and that's why documentation is part of the requirement. It's so vital. Um, and the problem is um, for a lot of developers, and I'm, I'm not going to say I'm one of them, but you always want to get the code working before you do the documentation because the code is fluid. And why do the documentation first when you don't know if the code's going to be working on Friday and you wrote the documentation to what it was on Tuesday, that type of thing. So, But finishing your development is so vital to the next team that, that it comes after you. And that, 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 that goes along with the same. I mean, people constantly come in and out of projects and, you know, it's not nice to hurt the follow-on um, people yeah i think that's something that comes with experience too because sure. you'll find that um you know the the most important thing is getting the code working right like of course we agree that's the most important thing 
But as uh, someone with more experience in software development, you are better able to plan and to document mm -hmm. your design and to envision uh, those things that are going to catch you up in the, the development process. So you can sort of architect around them before you ever set, you know, finger to keyboard. Um, and doing it that way enables you to write uh, good, concise documentation that will accurately reflect the program that has yet to be written. Versus a more novice developer is is really going to, you know, kind of hack away at it and go sort of iteratively. And that's, you know, the, the way to do it for sure. If you're if you don't know how to solve a problem and you can't envision um, how you're going to construct your solution, then you should start trying <laughs> and see what sorts of things, again, as Grady Booch would say, you discover about your problem domain. Right. So, well, I mean, that gets to the point of what do you do first? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm kind of the person that I don't like to sling code right away. I like to look at the problem I'm trying to solve first. You know, so requirements capture, analysis, design are all very important. If you do that right, the coding phase is short. Yep. And and hopefully <laughs> correct. Yep. And that's with experience. Exactly. <laughs> Gender, you'd raised your hand earlier, I think. Do you want to speak up? You're on mute. You might need to unmute yourself. The control's in the bottom if you mouse down to the bottom of your browser window. Maybe another person fighting permissions, too. Uh -oh. Well, hopefully he can sort that out and, and join us. Um, there's always the chat room. Yeah, there's always the chat room if you have a question, too. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention. So even in the commercial industry, this is still a problem. So my brother has the privilege of working for Aetna. So he came through the U.S. healthcare acquisition. And now they were recently bought by uh, CVS. He was telling me the other day on the phone that they're following the scaled agile framework for enterprises. This is a this is I think a perfect example of the half-assed agile development model where it imposes a lot of structure on something that's fundamentally unstructured. So they have these um, what they call development trains or, or feature set trains or you know there's terminology within that um, environment where program management has veto power over how things are being done or the prioritization of work, and it works against getting a lot of stuff done quickly. So so he finds frustration as a project manager, that, that's his role within Aetna, to um, deliver capability when he's got to go through these hoops and, and follow all these additional steps, even though they claim to be agile or they claim to be following some modern um, approach to, to software development. So I just wanted to interject that it's not unique to the public sector, those challenges. It's actually very much across the board and large organizations that have people that want to justify the jobs or positions they have, create that inertia against the kind of change that we're talking about. That's exactly what I'd expect at an organization that has been, you know, in business as long and has gotten as large as Aetna, you know, like that's, that's classic. And it's the exact same problem set that the DOD faces for largely the same reasons. We've just been doing things so long that we, we have inertia. <laughs> I like to say this has been really educational. My whole my whole um, thing with DevOps, um, I never really liked the term DevOps because for me, and I, I, I think it's really a bad uh, interpretation of what DevOps was really supposed to be about, and, and you helped clear that up for me. For me, DevOps kind of meant one person or maybe a small team does everything. Yeah. Like, wait a minute. Who's the cheapskate here? No. Yeah. They're not. It's not about reducing your your uh, your billets for the same job. Right. Well, <laughs> One of the things that sucks too is that um, depends on where you come from. Some, you know, they, you know, the customer always tries to get as much out of out of the team as they can for the lowest price. But it's like, all right, let's get realistic here. You know, yeah. what I think when you get when you get um, software developers doing system administration stuff, well, then they're not doing. The software development as well as the, or as, as much time as they can so it's like you gotta 
you know, you got to put the money out there too to to get the product you want. I'm done. <laughs> One of the things I think is really unfortunate is that the well has been sort of poisoned. Um, I think agile infrastructure really mm -hmm. clearly articulates the ideas of DevOps if you understand agile from its original intent rather than what it has become. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really unfortunate to me that um, we can't just call it agile infrastructure because um, that that's a great name for it. It's about the communication. It's about the people. Right. It's about the connections. And, and Mark um, alluded to this earlier. Uh, would you speak to the relationship to the risk management framework into DevSecOps? Because that's integral, the way RMF is structured. Yeah, so RMF um, is an interesting take. It's it's a much newer framework. It's only been uh, being used in the DoD for like the past two, two and a half years at this point, I believe. And they retired some of their old um, processes. So their old process that uh, most people are really familiar with um, in the DoD contracting org is the, the CON, the Certificate of Networthiness which is to say that you um, produce a piece of software and it is done and you have finished it and you deliver it to the DOD and, or Netcom really. And someone uh, or some authorizing official at Netcom um, evaluates your program using, you know, some presumably really robust process. It's not robust. And uh, at the end of the day, you get a stamp that says, this is net worthy, meaning we can run this on our network and and that certificate goes out and it has very specific product versions that it, uh, that it is appropriate for. And your product cannot change a certain amount within you know, those versions. And that certificate is what lets you run your software on arbitrary networks on the Doden. So the new RMF process uh, says that that is impossible to maintain, <laughs> um, which is true. Um, the new RMF process says that we must evaluate software for its risk. We must identify uh, the gaps between what is ideal and what is present in this software. We must be realistic about um, the expectations on this software and the modes of operation and the types of data um, and the impact of compromise of this software. And then once we've adequately really holistically assessed the risk, um, then we make a decision about how to mitigate that risk or how to accept that risk and, the, and some you know, level or authority needs to accept a certain amount of risk in the risk mitigation, uh, risk management framework for, for software. So um, one of the interesting things about the way RMF works is that it enables us to use continuous application of risk assessment. That is, they can define a set of gating criteria for a piece of software and say that as long as this software fits within this set of criteria and is continuously updated and meets you know, these needs, if it's performing its job, then um, you know, an, an authorizing official can effectively sign off on uh, perpetual risk within a set of guardrails. And that's where um, the RMF process is a process that can produce a conditional and continuous ATO. So a conditional and continuous authority to operate is a document that says, as long as this piece of software continues to meet this need and has these guardrails assigned and we've implemented these mitigations, it can forever operate with any arbitrary, you know, like version numbers don't need to be applied um, because it's a more holistic assessment of the software and how it works. So that process uh, is necessary for DevOps to work uh, for the DOD. Um, and it also goes back to um, in the DOD, if we have a, a, an organization where green suitors are writing software, which there are some, but they're few and far between. I was in our cyber, we had them, I was in one. Um, so if you're in one of those organizations, then those green suitors that are writing software have the ability to get an ATO for their own software and then continue to improve it live. Um, I would write code that made it to production the next day in my old organization. So, um, and that was through the RMF process and achieving a continuous and conditional ATO for some of the things that we were doing. Just to, just to elaborate on what James is saying, um, if you think of that infinity symbol with the development and deployment model, security surrounds that and the way i've seen that sort of specified is you I, you take the uh, approach of identifying what your risk threats are what your what 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 your potential vectors of of you know compromise are you add mitigations to address those specific threats you then implement those mitigations and measure their effectiveness in production so that's very important is the 
measure the capabilities that you're putting into production, not just the software features you're delivering, but everything else about your solution that's supposed to protect it, secure it, you know, you know, keep it whole. And then you repeat that process. So as you as you measure these things, if they're failing or not delivering everything you need, that then drives you to change your threat model, which drives you to potentially add different mitigations, measure those, and continue the cycle as well. So all of this kind of overlays and surrounds the, the software development and, and deployment life cycle. So, so it's something that's sort of um, not a bolt on, but, but just fundamental to the whole process itself. Yeah, it's, it's really not about, um, it's not about moving security to the left. You know, a lot of people want to say, oh, DevSecOps, that's where we have our developers just, you know, use more sound coding practices or something. It's not really about that. Those principles from DevOps, like I mentioned earlier, CAMS that includes metrics and sharing are, are very important um, to bring into the DevSecOps model where you understand what your security posture is. And that's where that RMF sort of evaluation of risk and the identifying of, of factors is really important for, for CAMS in order to understand the security posture of your entire holistic system, not just the software product. And, and it, it goes yeah, the, to the, the concept of the OODA loop. Oh, so, sorry, I, I, I jumped in. I'm sorry. sorry. But it goes to this concept of the OODA loop that was created, I think, within the Air Force, where Marine. we, oh, yeah, the Marines, OODA. So observe what's actually going on. Don't just want to see what you want to see or, or what it should be, but observe the reality of the situation. Orient your thinking and your processes to that reality. So, so accept that that's what's actually happening and you know, make sure you understand it, then decide how you're going to deal with it and then act appropriately and keep repeating that. And, and as you follow that, that's exactly the way you should be treating security. And, and I think that's what RMF is trying to embrace is this threat ma risk management. It's not the elimination of risk. It's not having 100% security. It's making the appropriate trade-offs to accomplish the mission. Yeah, we, we have... Um... In our organization, we've been talking about DevSecOps for five years, probably, and you know one of the th things we wanted to do was really you know implement uh, connect continuous uh, you know assessment into the development process, right? So part of the CI, it's part of the pipeline. You know you have testing that's going on, and much as Rich said, and and um, but we have yet to do it. And and one of the big challenges has been really because again we have separate groups doing each of these things. The security contractors are really not technical people at all. They're more a policy people so they don't really have the and then the development people are on contract to build those that pipeline so is there's, there's this hole that goes on to where they're still doing very manual work and so we can't get that that built yet so it's um but yeah i mean that's that's the dream is that you're continuously assessing as it's going in and then of course if if crms you know the continuous uh, risk management system which is DOD's, you know if that was fully up You'd be, it'd be continuously assessed and you'd have potential for continuous ATO, but you know, we're still still ways away. But we, we, they, they, we still are moving that way. Really, the do dollars are driving it because I know like in our, under our, our framework, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars for each accreditation effort. It's a lot of money. So that's probably driving it more than anything else, more than speed almost. Like it's, you know, they don't have the money to keep doing it. And we have multiple systems and each one needs to, you know, every two or three years is getting looked at. So. The beauty is that this model will not only cost less, but it'll actually work better. You know, <laughs> you'll be producing more secure stuff if you're continuously auditing. Um, and if you get to that point, you know, to have cheaper, better software, faster is just insane. Like, why are we not already doing this? I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> and I think people have to be realistic about expectations. That there was a great talk my my former manager gave where she was talking about it. It's more about the journey than the destination. So. DevOps is not a place you're going to end up in. It's, it's, a, it's a process of continually learning and continually improving what you're doing. So she had this illustration of a middle-aged guy, not the most athletic physique, running a 5K. And he decided for himself what better meant. So he's, his goal is not to be an Olympic marathon winner. His goal is to improve his health. And he's improving his health by entering a 5K and finishing it, not necessarily first or in the top 25 percent but just completing the race and i think that that's the model a lot of folks should follow when they're looking at these methodologies is 
define what better is for your organization. And maybe it's, you know, reducing deployment times by 20% or something. Set some goals for your organization and then start to implement these methodologies to achieve those goals and then try to do a little better the next time. Like, like it, it's, it's not to boil the ocean or to, you know, to change overnight how everything works. It, it's to define what better is for your specific situation and then pursue it. And I think, you know, these, these are proven ways of doing things better. And there's a lot of companies out there. You often hear the examples like Google and Amazon and Netflix, you know, these are the unicorns in the industry, but there's a lot of like fortune 500 companies that are doing things better. You know, Disney is an example of a company that's doing things better by embracing these methodologies. They're still very corporate. They're still very bureaucratic, but they're able to, uh, you know, leverage some of these technologies and, and techniques to improve how they deliver capability and, and what they're able to do. And if you've been to those parks recently, well, maybe not this year, but, you know, within the last sure. few years, everything has fundamentally changed on how you are able to access the parks, how you're able to, to buy things. You know, everything is through these smart bands that are tied to systems. There's a greater level of integration, and, and that's constantly getting better. So, so I see sort of as a consumer level the effects of these changes that, that the corporation has made. But... You know, these are, this is an example of not being, not trying to be the Facebook or the Twitter or the, you know, the, the top line. But. That's why I really like Flickr as the example that broke the DevOps story and broke it wide open. Because Flickr is like, how many of you use Flickr? Like, maybe out of this group, two, tops, <laughs> one, right? It's like, a, they're like nobody. Their development team was like two dozen people. It's like a, it, the whole company was like two dozen people in 2008. Um, and they, you know, but you've all heard of Flickr. You know, you know who they are. And they're still in business today and they're doing great. And their website is amazing. I actually don't, I don't use Flickr. I use Google Photos, uh, but <laughs> I have a pixel. I don't know what, I don't know what to expect, but um, I went to go check their website out when I was uh, originally researching this um, and it's amazing. It's gotten so much better. It's incredibly responsive. Everything just seems to work. There's a significant number of features that Flickr has that Google Photos doesn't. It's really good software. And they're just still doing it because they're just such a small crew that's able to, to continue to do this. And they've just used this model um, to, to just always be making better software. It's uh, It almost made me want to switch to Flickr, but I got the pixel, so I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that. But <laughs> they, they actually just FYI got, got bought out by a company called Smug Mug, like oh. a year ago, uh, which is a cool company too. So, so if, if you're in photography, Smug Mug is all about like you know kind of thing. And they were anyway. So I'm not sure where Flickr's going because they they've had a little trouble. It has nothing to do with their software. It has to do with more their model. They, they was everything was basically free for everybody. It's and tough to monetize. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't it wasn't uh, sustainable. But anyway, but they're yeah, not, not to. Not to but they worked for so long. It's right? been a long time. Yeah, yeah. They've been around a long time, and they started as a legacy company, um, doing things the old way, and, and they, you know, invented or transitioned to this model uh, on their own. It's it's a great example because they're not a Facebook or a Google. You know, there's no unicorn. You know, nobody's like, oh, Flickr is the darling of the tech industry. <laughs> Well, I, I think there's another lesson learned here, too, that if you're resting on your laurels or your belief that you have your industry controlled or maintained or it, 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 it's your thing, you know, that's been repeatedly proven wrong. The hotel industry is threatened by Airbnb. The, the taxi and limo industry is threatened by Uber. None of those companies own physical resources. Airbnb owns no properties. Uber owns no vehicles, yet they're able to fundamentally disrupt and compete in industries that were traditionally dominated by companies with large physical assets. So a lot of CEOs are waking up to this concept that the threat to their continued existence isn't from their immediate competition. It's from something off to the side that they didn't even see coming, where software is now the, 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 the new currency and how effective you can be competing with other organizations. Yeah, and that imperative goes back to like, why not use the best model for developing software? That's my whole point is if software is so vitally important um, for private companies and it's so vitally important for like national security interests from a defense perspective, you know, um, then why wouldn't you be using the model that clearly produces the best software? Well, the, the, beauty of, the beauty of the software industry is it keeps growing. 
I mean, they're, they're, the pie is just incredibly big now that it, uh, I'm so glad one of my sons is a, is a computer science major. Yeah, for sure. It's the, it's, um, I, I'm really grateful. So I don't have a degree. Oh, uh, good for but... you. <laughs> you want one of mine? <laughs> yes, I, I don't have a degree, but I was a, a young kid and my grandmother uh, had a math degree and mm -hmm. had been programming with punch cards and then retired as a web developer. Uh, so she knew um, that computers were going to be important. So I had my first computer very young, very early, and uh, I was programming yeah. very young. And um, I have to say, you did C++ at 9? That's yeah. impressive. That's impressive. <laughs> How was it? I was using Code Weaver. Code Weaver. Yeah. Jeez. Old, old times. Well, I got. I got to say, I, my first uh, experience with computing was with cards as well. Kind of dates me. I had a, a monochrome IBM PC with a, mm. you know, a um, the big clackety keyboard and a green and black monitor, and I played uh, Castle Adventure, which um, vampires were the letter T, and your character with <laughs> that symbol. Uh, so that was my first. I was, you know, like three, four playing that. Um, wow. So that that sort of, you know, like living in this world where computers are, are vitally important. I grew up in it, and um, I think that anyone that grows up in it today has to embrace it at some level in order to have a future, um, because everything is going to become automated, and the people doing the automating eventually are going to be the only ones with jobs left. So, a sad world. Yeah. You know, I, I've always believed that every freshman in college or even high school should have some basic cybersecurity seminar or course that they take. Just how to protect yourself online, how to be a little more, you know, understanding of what's going on behind the scenes so you're not subject to all these different types of attacks. It just make people a little more educated on how this all works. The other thing I'll say is that, you know, coming from the time period I grew up and a lot of folks on the phone here, resource constraints really don't exist anymore so not only is software vitally important but your access to computing and your access to be able to you know do things is, is unbelievable compared to how it was in the past like anything you can imagine you can pretty much do like like there's very little barrier of entry like there was before and mark you know you'll probably identify with this but i remember back in the day memory was so limited cpu power was so limited you had to carefully code and think about how you were using the resources of the machine itself to, to solve problems and not just the solution of the problem itself where the obvious solution was un unimplementable it was just too <laughs> too intense in time or memory and you couldn't could not make it happen yep hmm. yeah the, my kids do, do they even know the notion of having to go to the library to do research I don't know they, they have the computer. It's just like, why, why, uh, why go to a library when I can get everything I want on the web? I told you, I researched all of this with the Wayback Machine and Google, so. <laughs> or even typing a research paper where you had to leave space for footnotes and you were never really sure how much space to leave as you were. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, 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 I did a master's in cybersecurity last, I don't know, in the last five years, and I didn't have one physical class. I didn't go to one physical library. And it's it's pretty incredible. But that's the first time I'd ever had that experience. And yeah, I mean, there was really no reason to go anywhere. Everything was at my fingertips. It's, it's I'm really, cool. I'm really, I'm really wondering what the future of universities are going to be like because nowadays, um, you know, I mean, I'm 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 of the opinion that a bachelor is 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 kind of necessary unless you have a lot of experience and have good word of mouth but beyond that you don't need a master's in computer science anymore you can just go to coursera you can go to edx and, and basically get the training that you need in the particular specific area for you know pennies on the dollar you know it's i i, I just enrolled in a python class and it goes till december and it's only 346 bucks I mean that that is incredibly cheap when you consider how much my company's laid out for my master's in computer science. It's just like wow, things have changed. Well, and, and it's even beyond that. There's so much just free stuff out there. 
There's, there's stuff too. I, I mean, our, our, information. Our, our public library has a subscription to uh, lynda.com, which is incredible. Oh, yeah. it's, it's totally free, just through the county library. Well, well Frederick, Frederick County does that. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, and those are fantastic courses. I mean, and, and everything you'd ever want to do. It's just, mm -hmm. and, 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 I, and, and like you said, it was like, if you need hardware, if you need software, well, that's all right. basically free now too through you know, Amazon free tiers and, you know, Azure, whatever you pick. Well, your, there, there's nothing in the way of, of learning. Yeah, my yeah. son's, he, he has no degree. He's doing um, cybersecurity. Um, my, my undergraduate's music performance. You know, that was a long time ago. But, you know, I, I did go back and took some um, courses, obviously, to get started. But once you get started, it just rolls from there. You know? Right. Yeah. You have the motivation. Yeah, I'm very curious, not to digress too much, but what effect the COVID and kids learning from home is going to have long term on just education in general because folks are now seeing that you can do a lot without having to physically be present at a location. Now, some some courses, you know, like a chemistry lab or something, you, you're not going to do in your basement. Like, <laughs> well, that's, that's not true. My son is in the chemistry lab right now, and it's remote. <laughs> oh, <gosh>. Wow, <laughs> it'd be fun now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the rates are going up everywhere. Yeah, just have a hood and don't breathe too deep. I guess. <laughs> but it, but it's gonna. I think it's gonna fundamentally change a, a lot of, uh, you know, how how education is delivered, how people approach this kind of things. I'm really grateful. For, uh, like Red Hat um, hired me remote initially, uh, yeah. which a year ago before pre-COVID. Um, my position is a, a pre-sales architect position, so um, I don't really ever have to be on site implementing anything for long periods of time. I'm having meetings uh, with people and talking about things and requirements definition and solution, you know, architecting. That's my official title. So I, they tell me what their problems are. I tell them how software can fit together to solve those problems. And uh, that's something I can I could have done remote before. So Red Hat hired me remote before and. Uh, the closest office to me is two hours away in Atlanta. Um, and I, I'm on, uh, I was on the same team as Rich, and now Rich is on an adjacent team uh, that's out of the Tyson's Corner office um, up there. And I live in Augusta, Georgia. So, um, you know, depending on what you're doing, you don't need to be uh, located at work at all. And I, I've been remote this whole time. I'm impressed with Red Hat for several reasons. Um, where I'm at right now, they have a quote unquote Red Hat team that consults for the enterprise. And there are, there are, there are guys that live in uh, all over the country that basically fly in every week, do their, do their Monday through Thursday type of thing, and then fly back. And Red Hat covers the whole thing. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. We've got people, I mean, it, it's tough to have people everywhere you have customers. So well, have model. And certain customers you can't do remotely either. Right. Uh, for yeah. defense, for sure. I, yeah. I do have to say, though, the, the switch to uh, remote working is a little tough when you're used to travel or when you're used to drives to customer locations or, or plane rides. It tends to break up the week or give you a little downtime between meetings. Uh, and, and now it's just, you know, we're going, to, we're going like, nine to five every day zoom calls or you know, you know the equivalent technology like you're never you're, you're never unplugged and i think it's just it's taken a toll over time as folks that are used to travel you know probably worked 80 hours last week yeah exactly. sitting right here at this desk <laughs> you, can always, you can always open your laptop like there's you know not only is there no barrier entry there's nothing preventing you from when you think of something just dealing with it right which can be good and bad so, Mark, I think we're we're kind of all over the place now. Do you have a yeah? Do you have a specific uh, ads for upcoming meetings or things that we're going to talk about next? Actually, I do. I'm going to stop the recording now, uh, except to mention for this one, our next month is going to be the Mastodon system. But I'm going to stop recording, and uh, they can anyone you're listening can catch up on that meeting later.